but we can now get to elder abuse. So have a look at Anne and John, the next scenario. So Anne is an 87-year-old with dementia who was previously at another nursing home. She's admitted on, um, that actually should be um, November, we'll say, because I've brought the dates forward. <laughs> when she's admitted, her family tell, her that she, tell you that she has a tendency to make allegations against male staff members because she was abused by a male relative as a child. You try as far as possible to put Anne with female staff, but it, obviously it's not always going to be possible. So John's an enrolled nurse from an agency that you've used many times before. Staff say he's a very caring nurse and there have never been any complaints about him from residents or staff. He's working on 5 November on a night shift. Um, and on 10 November, Anne tells one of the personal care attendants that John hit her on the back two nights ago. Quick review of the roster shows that um, John was not on working that night. There's also no evidence of bruises on Anne's back. When management go to speak to Anne, she can't remember the incident and she can't even remember making the allegation. Now, do you think this is something you have to report to the department? No. No? Okay. And, and why, why do you think that's the case? Well, no, that was to say that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, and the evidence works against her. Yeah, she's saying that he was not. Yeah, it's never from the production part. Did you say confabulation? Yeah. Yeah. Because the board, you know, the nurse was working and all she did with it, yeah, it's all happened. But you didn't say that whether Anne had like dementia or... It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah she has dementia. Yeah. Dementia, yeah. For this case, I think we have to report. Yeah. And why do you say uh, that? Because, you know, we, we, we saw this lady got confused sometime, maybe. But that's, we just assumed. A person's country can change from time to time, and uh, even that night, because she may confuse, then then she can't remember which day what happened. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this has to be investigated, has to be reported to police. Yeah. Well, you have to report and, uh, to so because yeah. we don't know what things John's doing somewhere else, mm -hmm. so it could be something. Okay. It could um, be the previous week or yeah. somewhere. Yeah, like she can't remember that. It's a little mixed up because of that. Or the day. And what would you say if John had been away for six months and he had actually had worked at all with Anne on the ship? Would your, that change? Uh, because John also worked day shift as well. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen during day's work because they did not It's daytime or night time. So, yeah, mostly we, 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 we see John has no problem, but mm -hmm. there's a chance he has that problem. Mm, but always I need to consider about like this confusion. He may make up the story, but he because he maybe he she just confused, she couldn't remember his and he couldn't know what that would happen. Yep. Well it's cool, maybe it's not John somewhere else. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. So you have to make a reporting within twenty four hours so then mm -hmm. you can start your investigation. Yeah. It's up to the police to whether consider like, you know, yeah. whether it's serious or not. Well, we had a case like that not so long ago where one of the elders, um, she told us that she had a cupboard in her room and the door just flew out and the door was found on the other side of the room. The evening before, her son was there and he was found smoking in the room, which is not allowed, and he had alcohol. Mm -hmm. So one of the nurses came into the room and said, if you could please remove himself from the room because he wasn't allowed to smoke in the room. Um, so the next day, this lady was covered in bruises. So when uh, we all went in, you know, first the manager went in and then somebody else later on, to get a story out of her. She mm -hmm. doesn't have a diagnosis of dementia, but she's confused. Mm -hmm. So she kept changing the story. So my manager was actually didn't really know what to do. So she reported mm -hmm. because she had to report within the 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then within the 24 hours, the investigation went on and on and on. And she could then finally report when all the evidence was there mm -hmm. that the son was not 
he didn't do it, but yeah, yeah. So can I just clarify, did she say that at any point in the story that he had hurt her? Or no. 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 So it was just a bit of a confusion. The, the way the bruises were, she had bruises on, on her thighs and on her arms. Mm. It was just too suspicious and mm. the cover will not fly out. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. that. So as it turned out, he wanted money and he did jammed the door out of them, but he did not touch her. Mm. So it was it was complicated as well, but thinking of that, I thought, mm. yes, they have to report within the 24 hours, because you only have the 24 hours, don't you? Mm. For a report. Well, there's a little bit of a difference there um, that I'll just touch on a bit more later, because there's actually no allegation there. What you have is a reasonable suspicion. Yeah. So mm. it's within 24 hours of when you get that reasonable suspicion, um, but that may take a few days to get to that point. For example, the door flying out may not have, sorry, the cover flying out may not have itself been enough to trigger a reasonable suspicion, but then seeing the bruises the next day, well, maybe the 24 hours starts then. So that's kind of a difference there. But here we've got an allegation in Anne and John's situation. Um, and the answer is you do actually have to report it, um, although it's unreasonable. So um, I think it's important that we keep in mind um, the background to the demandatory reporting reforms when we're talking about um, when we're talking about um, these cases. Um, do, is everyone aware of what happened to, to make these changes to the law back in 2006? There was basically a really horrific case with um, four female residents in their 90s had been abused by a male personal care worker at a facility in Victoria. Um, the allegations included allegations of rape and the guy was actually eventually charged by the police. It attracted a lot of press because it came out the facility management had not reported the incident to police when one of the victims first made an allegation, it actually took them another nine months to even report it. Um, and so as a result, we have these mandatory reporting reforms as well as the police checks um, obligations. So what the S section says is that if an approved provider receives an allegation of or starts to suspect on reasonable grounds a reportable assault they are responsible for reporting the allegation or suspicion as soon as reasonably practicable and in any case within 24 hours to the police and the department. So 24 hours is your outer limit. Um, so whenever a person makes an allegation that a reportable assault has occurred, um, or in any, so then you do have to report. So even though Anne's allegation is quite, it's most likely untrue, that you still actually then have to report it. Could you let Anne bring the police itself and explain the situation? Well, hopefully the police would. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the obligation is on the approved provider, so yeah. they, they're the ones who have to make the report. But look, the police may know of Anne. She's been in aged care before, she's made those allegations before, and that will be taken into account in how they investigate. You have to be very careful what was documented. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's, um, documentation is absolutely lawyer will always tell you document, document, document everything. So that will always help you a lot. So um, yeah, in Anne's case, yes, we do have to report, and it's unfortunately this is one of the side effects of this legislation. We're trying to protect vulnerable people here, but there is going to be some effectively inefficiencies created here by this, where we know that this is very unlikely to be true. And even though she changed her story, we still have to report it, so. So every time I read and said it was something, you know, they that person hit me mm -hmm. last night. Yeah. And the other person, probably, not a good chance in hell, you sure it could replicate that. Yeah. Even like this severe dementia and all that sort of stuff. Yes, yep, so um, if the perpetrator has dementia, then there's a discretion. 
but the victim having dementia makes no difference at all. No. No, and it's a mistake that's commonly made. Um, we've had cases with big, big aged care providers who've not reported something because the person who made the allegation was, had dementia and they thought that then the discretion applies, but it's actually only when it's the perpetrator. What about if you think you've got a delirium? Same thing, you still have to. So it's still an allegation, so really as long as someone says, I've been assaulted, I've been raped, I've been hit, if it's an allegation of a reportable assault, then you have to report. But if like someone had a dementia and sees like wanderer and see hit on the person, sorry, what you say? If like um, someone had a dementia and that person hit to the other resident uh, who has dementia or not doesn't have dementia, in that case, would there gonna be like um, mandatory reporting or not? Uh, there could be a discretion there. So where the person who hits the other person has dementia themselves, yeah. then you don't necessarily need to report. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that you can't, and in some cases it might still be appropriate too, particularly if it's part of a really a series of quite challenging behaviours. I think then it's best to always report because it helps get the department um, aware of the difficulties with this person's behaviour and if you think that they may actually not be suitable for your facility, making sure the department knows that sort of early on is, is going to help you I think. So, but yeah, if it's a one-off and, and you know you can manage their behaviours moving forward then yeah, you may not have to report that. But there are some conditions for that which I'll go through a little bit more. But um, um, So just around this the, the situation you described was that second one of where there's a reasonable suspicion, or suspicion on reasonable grounds, I should say. So even where there's no actual allegation or where an assault may not have been witnessed, if staff observe signs of an assault, they, they could, that could give rise to suspicion on reasonable grounds. Obviously, that's going to be difficult in some situations. For example, if you see cigarette burns on someone, that's clearly going to raise alarm bells. Um, so that would, you would definitely go and report that straight away. But some bruises, like in that scenario, bruises can be a sign of abuse, but they, they could equally be a sign of something else. So I think in that case where you had the door, um, you know, popping open and um, also the bruises, I think there's, there is a suspicion there. And the safe, the safe um, case, the safe course of action is to report where there's doubt. But what if, um, what if it, well, in that case, it also is another example, what if the resident denies it happened? Is that reasonable then? It's really, it's really going to be quite a tricky thing, but if we always go with report, if it, nothing comes of it, you won't be in trouble that way. It's better than later on someone saying you should have reported that, because the agency might go and see the incident report and go, hang on, I don't see this getting reported to the department, and I think that you should have reported there, so. And usually the department will close off those investigations fairly soon. Um, yeah, unless... Can I ask, um, if... Okay, I also think we had a man who was, you know, quite aggressive, because um, he wanted to leave and whatever, he was quite aggressive and absconding and all of that. And um, one of the family for a different resident was visiting and they were opening the door and he wanted to leave and the guy blocked the entry, like, oh no, why don't you go and have a cup of coffee with the girls, Sam, and, you know, he refused and ended up in, like, a physical assault, um, ramming a frame into somebody and, you know, punching somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so now, he, this guy had a, a, a diagnosis of dementia, and it was quite obvious, quite well documented. Um, and if the facility chooses not to, um, to report it, but chooses not to sort of pursue it to the police, but the um, family member wants to report him because he feels like he was assaulted. He wants to report the police. Does the facility have to do it for him or does he just do it separately? Okay, so this is a situation where um, the person who's been assaulted is not a resident? Not a resident, just a third party. So um, in that case, it's not what we call a reportable assault. So it's only where the person who is assaulted is actually a resident. So, for example, someone assaulting a staff member, you don't have to report that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always occupational health and safety issues around that, and there may be an obligation under workplace health and safety legislation to make reports and to do certain things. But when it comes to the Aged Care Act, it's only where the victim is another resident. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
yeah. even if it happens on our <coughs> party, it's still because the third party is not on us. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, the police may, um, they'll, they might investigate that if he goes and makes a complaint. Mm -hmm. yeah, the facility manager would handle that issue, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, they should yeah. do and take that person inside. Yeah, that's definitely one where you want to get the, the management involved, I think, because there's obviously um, potential lawsuits and stuff around there. So, yeah, but um, no, it's not your responsibility to report that to the police. It was only if, say, another resident happened to be walking past and she got pushed in the meantime or something like that, that would then, in that case, be reportable assault, but it's only for people. And only re residential aged care recipients, not community care as well. So we don't yet have mandatory reporting in community care, although, you know, that could change, so. Uh, I work over with uh, one resident. Yeah. Um, she she didn't have diagnosed dementia, mm -hmm. and uh, an old man which was blind and also some kind of deaf, and uh, he wandered into her room and he and he tried to lie in her bed and then she just hit up, kicked him and he was on the floor because he didn't she didn't get uh, diagnosed dementia so we have to report to police but later my daughter was not happy because she said you should ask me first before you report to police mm. no I, I don't agree with that the, the family what the family's view is is irrelevant you you have to report the only question i'd have there is perhaps if i was looking at this in a legal way is is that an assault what she's done it's okay. Unreasonable use of force is what we're looking at here. Um, probably it is because she could have responded in a different way, but generally, someone, if she was feeling threatened, say he went to hit her and she pushed him back, that wouldn't, her actions may not actually be an assault because even if she, you know, perhaps pushed a bit too hard because she was sort of in self defence, so to speak. So, it's not safety, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we have to report to the police only because she was not big like an aging for this because she just like tried a kind of self-defense, is it? Yeah, yeah. That would be one possible thing to think about there, but I think reporting it to the police is the right thing to do. And they can make that call about whether it was an assault or not. I think, um, yeah. If sometimes when we, we're dealing with these situations, it's where um, there hasn't been a report made. So the department or the agency will speak saying you did the wrong thing and we'll say, we'll come up with arguments, for example, like that, well, this wasn't an assault, it wasn't an unreasonable use of force, therefore they didn't have to report it. But when you're <coughs> dealing with the safe situation, the safe thing is to report it. Yes, I think that's the right scenario there. So we go over to um, Margaret. So, so, oh yeah. So you say um, if it's a staff member who has been assaulted, mm -hmm. you don't, there's no need to pay report. No. You can still do an incident report if you just to the facility. Yeah, definitely. And um, under the occupational health and safety legislation, you have to keep records of things like that um, uh, as a part of the employee record, um, because if, for example, later on that person turns out they've been injured. Yeah, that, that would be relevant to their work cover claim. So, yeah. And there might be also other things you need to put in place that come under that more workplace health and safety. So, just looking at Margaret. So, also, she's also 87 and she suffers from severe dementia. So, one day a personal care worker finds her in her bed her underwear partially down, while her much younger gentleman caller hastily pulls up his pants and washes his hands. When interviewed, the woman said that she enjoyed having the man visit and called him her boyfriend. Margaret says that the man told her she was beautiful and kissed her, but that she would not have sex with him, and she denied any other sexual contact. But the rape kit revealed evidence of intercourse. So now, do you think um, this is a, a situation where you have to report it. Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> Correct answer. Um, so even though Margaret's saying, you know, there's, it's not making that allegation, um, because she said that he's kissed her, that of itself probably wouldn't be an allegation of assault. Margaret may have capacity to consent to someone kissing her, but when it comes to having sex, then she probably doesn't have that capacity given she's got severe dementia. Um, and it's also relevant um, 
here that the, the, the guy, he's not a resident himself. But what I thought, what if we had um, another male resident who also had severe dementia? What do, you, what do you think we'd be having to report it there? You mean one, the male resident with dementia had sex with the female? The female, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I would say they didn't have to report it. And um, so what, what makes you say that? Um, we don't know if either of them consented to it. Mm. Yeah. Um, so they might, yeah, we don't know who mm. consented and if, if, we don't know if it's consensual, it could have just, just done it, but we don't know mm -hmm. the dynamic between them. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for the safety it's better to report it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the two scenarios are um, quite different and the, the reason is because while let's take it as a given that Margaret had no capacity to consent, she just can't consent to sexual intercourse, the difference is around the other person and their intent. So um, the crime of rape is where you intentionally have sex with someone without their consent. So because this other guy also has severe dementia, he may actually not have that capacity to make to form that intent. So that's just a, a, a sort of other complexity around it. I think you're right in that you would report it just to be on the safe side. But ultimately, if both of them are happy and, and you, you do think that on some level they consented, then A, that wouldn't be a crime in itself. But also the fact that someone can't, hasn't got that capacity may mean that they've not committed a crime. And that's you know, well recognised within the law that someone would diminish, it comes in, in cases where someone's drunk, for example, they may not have capacity to hurt someone, um, to intentionally hurt someone. It may be another type of issue around recklessness, but under the, um, uh, these, uh, the reportable um, assaults issue, it's around intention, so. So what do you do then, if you take the scenario further, like if both parties have dementia, mm. and you choose not to report because of the fact what's mentioned before. Would you, as a as caretakers, would you try to keep them apart, or is that or is, are we then restraining them? From yeah, each other? it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because and I suppose it would depend on what their families wanted. Um, because ultimately, both of them are happy. Then there's really no harm, is there? I mean, you'd have to be very cautious to monitor them and assess and make sure they are both, both um, you know, happy with the, the situation. But people should be able to to make choices for themselves, as we've been emphasising. My mother was a, was a caretaker um, in the Netherlands, yeah. and um, there was she always told me this story. There was this couple that both had dementia, but they would always go into each other's rooms, and they would have intercourse or some form sex together and um, nursing staff was basically told not to come in and not to go yeah. in and they wouldn't. Yeah. They only made sure that the curtains were closed because their room was quite next to the entrance so it's a bit shocking for people who would come in and see. But they would let them be. Yeah, and I think that's um, yeah, a perfectly acceptable way to handle that scenario, I think. Yeah. The, the difficulties become though when you've got one family member who's saying, my mm. mother can't consent, that's right. You would definitely not do a form of family, yes. Mm. Mm. I think it's different if they're a couple. That they weren't a couple. They weren't oh, they were, oh, okay. Um, because there was um, a place I used to work, there was this man and he had dementia and one of the ladies had dementia as well. But he was um, very sexually disinhibited, so to care staff he would, you know, smack bombs, he would squeeze people, he, would, he was very inappropriate. Um, and I think with us, we can manage, as staff, we can sort of manage it. Mm -hmm. But then um, there was another lady who had sort of quite severe dementia. And a couple times he was found in her room. Mm -hmm. And you find they both do have dementia. Um, but it just felt as if he was a bit prettier towards her because mm -hmm. she was, um, the other ladies, you know, would be like, oh my god, you know, go away. But she was a bit more pliable. So in that situation, where they both have their spouses and their kids come in and they hear the stories that dad is visiting Mrs. Jones and you know it's inappropriate and he was found in her bed, what do you do there? Um, just what do you do? Do you separate them or what do you do without breaching either of their rights? I think that yeah, the questions around her vulnerability a bit there, and I think it would depend on 
you know, what her reaction was a bit and whether you could see that affecting her negatively. But I think given that the family are uncomfortable with it, he's, there's that suspicion that he's being a bit predatory there. I think, you know, putting in some safeguards to prevent it from happening is probably the, the wiser scenario there than, for example, in another situation where both people seem, you know, really happy with the situation. So, yeah, it's really going to be a matter of just looking at all the risks um, and, you know, we all know what can happen when a family member gets on, you know, wants to make a complaint and how difficult and how time-consuming that can be. So, um, you've got to look at those that, that as well. So, yeah, and I think the fact that other people are finding him perhaps a bit predatory and he is doing things that are non-consensual with the staff, for example, that would raise some concerns about his interactions with this lady. Does that answer your question a bit? Not really. It just feels like there's nothing we can do, basically, because we don't want to infringe on anyone's right. And if he has diminished capacity or you know he doesn't have intent to harm mm -hmm. someone because he doesn't think he's harming anyone and he believes that you know he's not being you know um, he's not being yeah predatory and he believes that um, therefore he doesn't have intent, therefore it's not a crime. Mm. So, I don't know, it doesn't really, it's a very grey area to me, it sounds. It is, it is a definitely a grey area, but as well as his um, rights uh, um, and the fact that he's not commi maybe committing a crime, we also have to look at the residents, that right for residents to live in a safe, secure environment, and you, it, there could be an allegation that that lady is not in a safe, secure environment. So you've kind of got to balance those two issues out there. And I think in that scenario, separating them in some way or perhaps just doing site checks or what other ways would people manage that, do you think? You guys probably know we better. We've had a, a very similar situation at my work. We just simply separated them. The lady lived in the upstairs room, the man lived in the downstairs room, and they, their cars never crossed again. So yeah. Then, yeah. Do you think that would work? In um, there was. It was a place with only one dimension specific unit and then that would be more tricky. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is tricky. Yeah. yeah. Well, what are some other strategies you could use half there? Half an hour of vigil check. <laughs> like half an hour of vigil check. Mm -hmm. We put someone like if there's an incident or something like this then we immediately commence them on half an hour of vigil check. Yeah. To just check whether where they are and what's happening and those sort of things. And is it always being done really? I once um, had once had a case where someone was on a sighting chart and we had to get all of them and there were some dates where there, there were multiple multiple entries for the same time and you know one had him in the kitchen and one yeah. time he was in the lounge room and one he was in his room so kind of got a question that sometimes but legally that's the legal document but it's, yes. it's up to like you know no, the staff right. yeah. it can it's not just 30 minutes the fact that it's not something that is really done mm -hmm. 30 minutes you say it's a very long time for someone to get into the act and finish it yeah, yeah. half an hour yeah, yeah. Mm. So, so what if the both elders want it and the family doesn't well i think in that case it's about educating the family around that yeah. because yeah. people do have that right yeah. um and you know families don't get to make a call on whether their mum or dad um you yeah. know gets to have sex so yeah. i think um yeah and that's where it's really a bit of a community and family education and and as we all know it's perhaps not the easiest topic to talk about with families so i can appreciate that that's challenging but yeah, this is a really difficult area for providers. Um, one of the most difficult, I think. I think if I could add something mm. in there, Anita, the, the, there are some recognized, well-recognised indicators of well-being. If those indicators of well-being are present, and they're usually body language indicators, such as smiling, leaning towards somebody, touching, eye contact. If you're seeing those indicators of well-being, then you would, that would suggest that it's okay for the relationship or the contact to proceed, particularly if they're mutual. But if you see signs of passivity, where somebody is being acted upon by another, then that would indicate that that's not okay. Mm. 
So you actually need to see overt signs of well-being to think this interaction can proceed. So they need to be clear indicators that this is pleasurable for both parties and that there's freedom to participate. So there's no coercion, but there is signs of pleasure or you know, willingness to engage in the interaction. The, the important part is that you document what you see. Mm. And there are there is a checklist I've got that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yes, the family can be denied, like, you know, they can mm -hmm. be. My mother's not like that. Yeah. 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 Even yeah. you yeah. document yeah. like yeah. pictures yeah. what you see, and then the family can come and say that no, my mom mm -hmm. doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What if um, one, it's a, it's a married couple, they've been together for years and years, and um, it happened that it used to work. The lady had quite severe dementia and she um, was sitting in the top chair. She had really lost a lot of her function and the man hadn't and he was sort of, he would come, you know, every now and again and just, for, I guess, for sex with her. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't, in that situation, is she consenting? Is the fact that they're married for so long implicit consent or, or what? It goes to it and you might surprise you, but in the UK, the concept of rape within marriage was only recognised in 1992. So until that time, a husband could effectively rape his wife and it was not a crime. Um, but we now say, you know, the fact that someone's married does not mean that they consent to sex with that person forever. So, um, you know, I, I think you would be looking at those wellbeing signs that, that Bernie just spoke about and really is, is the wife responding in a positive way to that? And if not, then yeah, you'd be treat it the same as any other scenario, bearing in mind that history and, you know, that they have been married for so long. So, yeah, it's just always a, a bit of a grey area, but I think that those guys, those steps are very So that, that's a recordable offensive Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thankfully, yes, we do recognise that as a crime now, so... <laughs> where probably no one's going to make a complaint about it because the family, well, it depends, but, you know, the family are probably not going to raise concerns there. But that doesn't mean her rights aren't being infringed on necessarily. And I think that, you know, what those wellbeing signs that Bernie was speaking about would be really, it is worth putting in that monitoring place just to ensure that she is, you know, being... Mm. Um, taking photographs of, of her body with a digital camera that's time dated mm. uh, before she goes out mm. and then mm. in the days following yeah. is is often a very useful way to track mm. the likely occurrence of when when any bruising occurred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are ways to monitor mm. that, that can yeah. fulfil a responsibility yeah. there. And maybe once in return, if you see any bruise and stuff, of course you're going to do the incident reporting and stuff like, you know, even like what yep. was the cause you don't know like yep. it's not like husband harming but you have to find out why mm -hmm. why it's happened and how it's happened what, what would the outcome be if you reported something like that to the police oh look mm -hmm. that the police are a whole yeah. other um, or, or yeah. the department of age got, like what, what's the outcome <coughs> of like reporting probably not much okay. yeah. Yeah. how are we going for time i'm just we do need to have a break yeah, yeah. Five, two, yeah. all right why don't we take a short break in maybe 10 minutes? Is that good? Uh, just before we wrap up on the reportable assaults, I think we've been through quite a lot of that. Um, so it's basically those are the different elements of what is a reportable assault. So we've spoken about unlawful sexual contact, um, unreasonable use of false, or those other parts don't really matter because um, there's nothing in the accountability principles, basically. But 
you'll note there that it's inflicted upon a person receiving residential aged care. So that's where it's not the case of the staff member. Um, so we've also just spoken about this discretion, so I thought I'd just go into that in a little bit more detail. So Sorry, I've So it's, the discretion applies where the alleged assaults are perpetrated by the, a resident with an assessed cognitive or mental impairment. That is often going to be dementia, but isn't always the case. So it could be um, some kind of it could be schizophrenia, or it could be another kind of. What other conditions do you think might affect someone's capacity to to, to um, depression? Mm -hmm. Yep. Quiet brain injury might be another case where that is. Um, there's some good material on the, in the guidelines around what that meaning is. Um, but the, the key thing is that it's, it affects their cognition um, in that way. Um, also, if there's a report of the same or similar incident later on, you don't have to report the same thing twice. Um, if you are going to uh, rely on this um, exception to report, there are some conditions. So you have to put a behaviour management play, plan in place with the re, in relation to the resident who committed the assault. Um, and you should, there should be a copy of the resident's um, cognitive, uh, of the assessment of the resident's cognitive or mental impairment on the resident's file, as well as a record of that behaviour management plan. So um, those are what you're going to need to show the department if they turn up and say, why did you not report this? You need to have those documents.